Okay, so for this audio lecture, we'll be talking about dairy fermented foods. So for fermented dairy um, food products, they fall into two different categories, cheeses and fermented milk products. Um, and within the fermented milk products, we have like yogurt, Carefo, um, sour cream, and buttermilk. Um, so in this lecture, we'll focus on the cheeses, yogurts, and buttermilk. Um, just as a kind of um, note, we will talk about raw and non-fermented milk um, in our next unit when we talk about foodborne illnesses. And so just um, to kind of make sure we all have the same terminology with raw milk, this is going to be milk that directly comes from the mammal. Um, and for the U.S., this mostly comes from cows, but we can also have some um, smaller like eco farms that might have different types of uh, mammals that um, can be utilized. And so I think I, I shared the link of a farm that even has like, uh, they have everything from like goats to buffalo to even um, camel's milk that you can get. And you can get it either in like a raw form, pasteurized form, or you can get it as like a yogurt or cheese or some other um, variations, okay? Um, in general, when we have milk that we're going to consume, it's been pasteurized. So this would be known as market milk. Um, and it comes in different varieties as whole skim, low fat, um, or flavored milks, or even uh, creams. Um, and whether it's like whole milk or skim milk or low fat, it depends on the fat content. So they can be altered um, to, to have different levels of fat concentration. Okay. Um, where raw milk hasn't been treated to alter the fat concentration, okay? With pasteurization, this is where it's been heat treated, um, and this is to um, inhibit the growth of microbes to kill off um, the large population of microbes that potentially are in the milk. So keeping in mind that milk is going to be our starting material for our dairy fermented dairy products. And so when we look at the composition of milk, um, it's going to be majority water, but there's also fat molecules in there and proteins and sugars. Okay, And so keep in mind from a microbial standpoint um, that the fats, the proteins, and sugars like lactulose um, can be food sources for the microorganisms so we can get fermentation of those products. Um, most of the fermentation um, focuses on lactulose because that's going to be the major sugar that's being found. But we also want to keep in mind um, that the fats and proteins can also be metabolized and so some of the byproducts that are formed um, are going to be because of the breakdown of the proteins into amino acids. Um, and we also want to keep in mind some of the different textures we're going to get are because of different fat compositions um, and protein compositions, okay? Um, when we look at proteins, um, the major proteins fall into two different categories, um, casein um, and whey, okay? And so um, if you look at um, different products that have milk in them, um, you might see that there's whey in them or you might see that there's casein in them. Um, so casein would be the major product that's going to be found in like milks or in um, cheeses. So we'll talk more about um, casein later on. There are another, a number of other materials that are in milk, um, keep in mind because it's our starting material. Um, and so there can be natural antimicrobials that are being are found. Um, some of these are produced by the microbes that are present in the milk, um, but also could be produced by the mammal that is secreting it. So we have like in glutens, um, we also have this lactoperoxidase um, system um, that helps to prevent some of the microbes from growing in there. Um, there can also be some trace antibiotics, um, and this is can either be from the food um, that the animal is consuming. So some food that animals consume um, can have antibiotics in it, and so that could be present in the milk. Um, to note, the, US, um, the USDA, which regulates uh, livestock, um, has made rulings that um, antibiotics should not be added into the food unless absolutely necessary. The other reason there can be antibiotics um, in the starting material is because maybe an animal is being treated for an infection. Um, now, an animal that's being treated for infection based on USDA guidelines and rules should not, um, should be 
um, that milk should be withheld from the raw milk that ends up going into the processing. Um, and so the gen general guidelines are that um, seven days after the stopping of antibiotics, um, the milk ha for up to seven days after the um, antibiotics has stopped, um, that milk should be withheld. Um, also, most dairy farmers will test the milk um, for antibiotics um, so that raw milk um, isn't being shipped that contains antibiotics, and some farmers even go a step of testing the animal to make sure there's no um, trace antibiotics present. Um, so obviously there's a cost to just dumping the milk. Um, so you still have to milk the cow even if it's being treated um, because otherwise milk production um, stops. So you're just dumping that milk. So obviously a farmer would want the milk um, from, from any of their cows to be utilized as soon as possible, but obviously um, they also don't want to risk contaminating the whole batch of milk that's being utilized. There's also going to be um, some heat-stable proteases and lipidases that are going to be produced by some of the um, psychotrophic um, bacteria. Keep in mind that those are the bacteria that are going to low, um, survive at lower temperatures. Um, and so again, they can produce um, protein, prote um, proteases that would break down proteins and lipidases that would break down lipids. And so this can change the chemical composition of that milk, that starting material. Okay. Just like any of these factors can affect um, the growth of our starting cultures. So if we have too many um, natural occurring antimicrobials or antibiotics or these heat stable proteases and lipidases, then our starting cultures wouldn't be able to grow. Um, so that would affect our end product. So just looking at some of the common microbes that are found in dairy, um, streptococcus would be one of these. Um, so just jog in your memory from your intro bio class. Um, so streptococcus, those are going to be chains of um, spears. So these are non-motile, um, they're facultative anaerobic. And these are mesophiles, so they like our body temperature. They like the body temperature of mammals, um, so they don't like cold temperatures. Um, also, they're known to produce acid, so lactic acid. Um, so they can actually cause the pH to be reduced, which then makes it unfavorable to some of the pathogenic um, strains. This is actually like a good thing. Um, streptococcuses can ferment um, fructose, mannose, and lactulose. Um, for as their sugar source for fermentation. We also have lactococcus. Um, so again, coccus, they're gonna be spears. Um, they're usually found in pairs or very short chains. Um, again, non-motile and um, facultative anaerobes and mesophiles, um, but they can grow at um, colder temperatures um, down to um, 10 degrees Celsius. They produce lactic acid um, and they are able to um, hydrolyze um, lactulose and casein. And some strains can also ferment um, galactulose, um, sucrose, and mannose. And they can actually, um, they're critical in um, production of fermented um, dairy foods. And there are several, several strains that can actually um, produce bactericidins. Um, so bactericidins are these kind of natural um, antimicrobials um, that will actually inhibit the growth of gram-positive um, bacteria. And can, it can actually be used as biopreservatives, preservatives, and we'll talk about those later on. We have um, propion bacteria, um, and so these are rod shapes, um, and we can find them either individually or into short chains. They're non-motile, they don't produce um, endospores, and they're um, anaerobic, but they are tolerant to air. Mesophiles, so again, they like the temp body temperature of mammals. Um, if we did a catalase test, they would be positive. They can ferment um, glucose, and in the process of doing that, they produce peponic acid, hence their name, and acetic acid. Um, so both of um, propionic acid and acetic acid can change the flavor profile of your material. Um, proponic bacteria um, is usually inoculated with Swiss cheese, and that 
acid, um, proponic acid gives it kind of that bitter taste that's characteristic of Swiss cheese. Okay. And depending upon the species, they can also ferment lactose, sucrose, fructose, galactose, and some other of the sugars. Okay. So another um, bacteria that is found in dairy products is bifidum bacteria. Um, so interestingly, this isn't always naturally occurring. Sometimes um, the material is inoculated with this bacteria. Okay. Um, it was previously put into the genus Lactobacillus, so it has a lot of the same characteristics of the Lactobacillus bacteria. Um, so they're going to be gram-positive rods. Um, they're going to be non-spore forming, non-motile, anaerobic. Um, they can tolerate oxygen, um, but they need to have carbon dioxide available. Um, their optimal growth is, are mesophiles, um, and they don't grow in um, high pHs, so um, basic pHs or very acidic pHs. So they, they're neutrophilic. They like that kind of middle pH range. When they ferment glucose, um, they're going to produce um, lactic and acetic acid. Um, and it's at a two to three ratio, um, and they don't produce carbon dioxide. Um, they're also able to ferment lactulose, galactose, and some of the other sugars. So looking at some of the different um, probiotic strains that are utilized in um, fermented um, dairy products. So keep in mind with these strains, these are would be isolated lab strains that are being added in. Um, so they could be naturally found, um, but when we're talking about a probiotic, usually that's being um, added in. So this would be a controlled fermentation, so kind of commercially available. Okay. Um, and this paper that this table's coming from is looking at some of the health benefits of fermented dairy products. And so again, the idea of these strains that are added in that are used to produce yogurt, to produce... Um, different fermented milk products, um, again, that they would have this added health benefit because of the microorganisms that are produced, because of the fermentation process, because through the fermentation process, you're going to get the breaking down of the sugars. So if you're lactulose um, intolerant because you don't produce lactase, um, the bacteria would be able to um, break that down so that if you were sensitive to lactulose, um, you would be able to um, consume that product. Um, also, some of the proteins are going to be broken down into the amino acid fragments, um, and so that can help um, make it for someone who's sensitive to those proteins um, so that it'd be more, um, you could potentially have less of the side effects from it. So when we're looking at some of the different um, bacteria that we were just talking about, um, they can undergo different fermentation processes. Um, so we're going to kind of flip this lecture and talk about some of the fermentation that under, um, in general, and then we'll look more specific at some of the different um, dairy fermentation products. Okay. So the two different processes that are occurring are homolactic and heterolactic fermentation. We talked about this with the um, bread. Um, so those lactococcus um, bacteria can undergo homolactic um, fermentation. The streptococcus that naturally would be present are going to undergo homolactic fermentation. And then the lactobacillus bacteria, depending upon what group they're in, can either undergo homolactic or heterolactic. And then our bifidinum bacteria would undergo um, heterolactic fermentation. So what does all this mean? Um, and again, I know I showed a figure for the bread, um, but this looks at it in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, we start with our glucose and through um, what we'd recognize as glycolysis or the EMB pathway. EMP pathway. Um, we are going to get the breaking down of the glucose um, formation of um, fructose 6-phosphate, um, and we have to put ATP into that. We are going to end up getting ATP production um, in the production of pyruvate. That pyruvate further gets broken down in the production of lactate um, or lactic acid. Okay. Um, and so I don't expect you to memorize all those individual little steps. Um, so down at the bottom in the brackets, we have this glucose going in. We're going to get two lactic acids 
um, being produced into ATPs netted. Um, so down in the brackets for these figures, they kind of given you an overview of the process. And again, this is for homolactic fermentation. So homo, same, so we get the same um, process, um, same um, product being formed from our glucose, from our pyruvate. For heterolactic fermentation, um, we break down the glucose, we get the um, production of pyruvate, um, but then from the pyruvate, we're going to end up getting um, one of the pruvates is going to be formed into lactic, lactic or lactic acid, and then the other one would be formed into acetic acid or ethanol, depending upon the organism. Um, we do get the byproduct of carbon dioxide, and so this is again what we would notice as being the gas being produced, and we get um, two ATPs and an um, NADH being formed okay, in general. So again, the idea with homolactic fermentation is we're just going to get the lactic acid ferment, um, production. With heterolactic fermentation, um, we have a mixture of um, lactic, lactic acid production and then a production of ethanol or it could be acetic acid. So in dairy fermentation, one of um, the byproducts that can be formed is diacetin. And so this is actually produced by um, citrate. And so citrate's present, um, we can get the diacetin um, being produced. And this actually gives um, the dairy product this buttery flavor um, to it. So it, it lends to the flavor profile. And then as I mentioned, um, another possibility with looking at the metabolism with the proponic um, bacterium, we get proponic acid being formed um, from the glucose. And we just do want to keep in mind, um, as I mentioned, with um, the bifidotum bacteria that we actually get this um, production of two lactic acid and two, three acetic acid and Three ATP. So they undergo a different fermentation process than we see with our um, lactobacillus bacteria. There are additional other byproducts that are formed. So as I mentioned, the proteins can be broken down into amino acids. Um, and so sometimes this is, allows for um, growth of the bacteria so that they can synthesize uh, more lactic acid. Um, and this can benefit the person consuming the product because, again, the proteins are more broken down um, and so they're easier to process. Um, and, and some of those um, epitopes that the immune system might recognize um, might get broken um, so that the person wouldn't be able to, their immune system wouldn't be able to recognize it too. Um, we can also get sugar alcohols like mannitol being produced. Um, so some of the lactic acid bacteria um, are able to do that. Also, um, some of the lactic acid bacteria um, are able to produce folic acid. And so um, usually that folic acid, the folate that's being produced is utilized by the bacteria, but there are some strains of lactolactus um, that actually can produce like three times the amount of folic acid. So they actually end up secreting it into um, the food product, which would then make it, you know, you as a human, if you consume it, yay, you get more folic acid from it. So some areas of research are looking at um, designing the, the starting cultures so that they produce more of these beneficial um, uh, byproducts so that they become, you know, more probiotic-like, uh, more beneficial to your health. So next what we're going to do is look at some of the different um, fermented milk products um, that can be produced. And so looking at buttermilk, um, it's actually produced by using skim milk, and then it's through controlled fermentation with starting cultures that it transforms into buttermilk. Okay, um, You can make um, homemade buttermilk that's not um, utilizing controlled fermentation, but again, most buttermilk that you're buying in the grocery store, it's going to be under controlled fermentation where they're using starter cultures in order to do that. Um, it ends up having a, an acidic taste, and that's because of the lactic acid. And then there's a high degree of aroma to it, and that's because of the diacetic. Um, and then there's, um, it has a slight effervescence um, kind of 
fizziness to it, if you will, um, and that's because of the carbon dioxide that's produced by the bacteria. So then um, appearance-wise, it's going to have a white color. It's going to be kind of smoother um, and thicker than you would see with like skim milk, um, but it st should still be easy to pour, so not as thick as you would see like yogurt. So in um, the production and manufacturing of buttermilk, again, you're going to start with um, skim milk. You go through a filtration to somewhat concentrate it. Um, and then generally um, you would pasteurize it so that you're starting with a clean slate. Um, so the pasteurization, the heating of the milk, um, it causes it so that any of the bacteria that were present in your starting material, your skim milk, um, would be removed. You cool that, um, and then you would inoculate it. So the cooling process is important because if you just inoculated it and it was still warm, um, you would end up killing all your bacteria. After the inoculation, it would be incubated um, so that coagulation can occur. Um, so this causes a kind of a thickening of it. Okay, um, And then this can be stored. Right, and so then when we look at buttermilk metabolism, it's the leuconostoc um, bacteria that's been inoculated that undergoes um, lactulose hydrolysis. Um, so it's going to take the lactulose um, and convert that so that we get pyruvate um, and then um, lactic um, production. Um, we can also get it where we get lactic production with car um, carbon dioxide and acetic um, or ethanol. So we can either get um, homo or hetero lactic fermentation. Um, and then um, leuconostric is also able to metabolize citrate. So um, the diacete um, would also be produced. Um, and again, that would give it some of it, that buttery kind of characteristic um, taste. So next, next looking at yogurt. Um, so yogurt um, is going to be more solid-like than we would see with buttermilk, but not as solid as cheese, so it's kind of intermediate. So it has a semi-solid state. Um, and so it forms by the coagulation of milk, and um, you can use different um, milk to, as starting material, skim, low, or um, full fat. And then um, traditionally, uh, star cultures are going to be added <clears throat> so that um, you end up with something that has a sharp acid taste because of the um, lactobacillus bacteria that are present in there and the acid productions, but it also will have some kind of walnutty um, flavors in it. And then it has a smooth mouthfeel to it. Okay, so the flavor profile of yogurt is because of those byproducts that are formed. So the acetaldehyde, um, lactate, diacete, and acetate um, that are produced. And so most of the flavor is actually coming from the acetaldehyde, um, and that is going to be produced um, either by the streptococcus um, from the conversion of glucose to pruvate. Um, also, um, theranine can be converted um, to produce acetyl, acetaldehyde. So um, <clears throat> there's definitely commercial approaches um, to producing yogurt, but I just wanted to present some, you know, at-home recipes. So in case you wanted to make, try your hand at this, um, maybe this would give you the confidence to do that. So beginning process is starting with your milk. Um, and so you then want to heat the milk. And again, the idea of this is that you're going to um, kill off any kind of the microorganisms that would be present. Um, so you're doing your at-home pasteurization of your milk. Um, and then what you would do is add in some yogurt which you've purchased. Um, so you, you want to use a yogurt that doesn't have fruit in it. Um, so your good old-fashioned plain yogurt um, that has live cultures. So you do want to make sure that you check that you purchase one that has live cultures. Um, nowadays, most of them do have that. And so what you're using is that um, it's almost like doing a, a backslop, right, where you're taking... Um, microbes that have, have been proven to make good yogurt and you're inoculating it into your starting material so that you hopefully will replicate that same yogurt um, that you had purchased right um, <clears throat> so obviously in a commercial setting they're just gonna they're going to their micro lab and pulling out their starting cultures 
okay, to have a controlled um, fermentation. And so after it's been inoculated, um, you then want to um, store that for several hours. Um, that allows the microbes to utilize the sugar, the lactulose um, that are present, um, ferment that. Um, if you want to thicken the yogurt, um, to have something more like a Greek yogurt um, style, um, you would strain that to remo remove some of the excess um, liquid for your yogurt. So um, one of the main um, components that are being um, utilized is the lactulose. So again, this is where someone has an intolerance to lactulose because they don't produce enough lactase. Um, they might be able to still able, able to eat yogurt because those bacteria that are present, the lactobacillus and streptococcus, would utilize the lactulose um, as it has converted the glucose and galactose. Um, lactose um, and utilize it to produce lactic acid. And then the other pieces with the yogurt metabolism is the production of um, diacetyl. And so again, that production is going to happen through the lactobacillus. Um, so breaking down the glucose to produce that. We also have the acetyl, um, acetylaldehyde um, that gets produced that gives it the majority of that walnut-y type flavor. There's additional breakdown of um, milk proteins. Um, so lactobacillus, um, different species will produce um, proteinases. And so those will help to break down those milk proteins into peptides. And then we also have peptidases that will further break that down. So we have amino acids. Um, and then again, those amino acids like theranine can then be utilized um, to produce some of the flavors for those acetaldehydes. So next we're gonna look at cheese. Um, so, you know, this, this is its own group when we were looking at um, fermented dairy products. And so it's a result of coagulation of casein, um, which is a protein that's found in milk. Okay, and so through the um, breaking down of the casein by lactic acid bacteria, we're gonna get lactic acid production. Um, this process can be performed with or without renin. Um, so renin would be one of the major enzymes um, that's utilized in cheese production. And so we need to have the coagulation that happens, but then we do draining. And then um, for some cheeses, there's ripening that happens. Um, and so again, for some cheeses, the hard cheeses, we're going to have these three-step processes in order to produce our cheese. For other cheeses or soft cheeses, um, this is where only coagulation and draining occur. Okay. For coagulation and ripening, these are the critical steps that microbes are going to play a role in. So there is a you know huge history of cheese. Um, you know it's one of the probably early fermented foods that um, humans um, probably accidentally discovered. Um, so there's different theories of how um, it was discovered, and so one of them that's kind of held is that. Someone was storing milk in a calf stomach, and there was enough renin left over. Um, so you produce renin to digest material. So there was enough renin um, present, and then there was also lactic acid bacteria um, present in that calf stomach that was used to store it. And so in the process of that, um, they ended up having um, cheese forms. And if we look through history, there's lots of evidence of um, cheese making being um, present in different cultures. Um, and so this is a drawing, um, a historical drawing, um, showing in ancient Egypt um, the cheese making process. Um, on the right hand side, um, they have found in a number of different cultures these um, pots that have holes in them. And when they analyzed what was actually stored in the pots, um, they were used to store cheese. Um, so allowing for that ripening process to occur. So looking at the general process of producing cheese, um, th there's a traditional cheese making process and then there's the most cheese making. Um, so for most cheese making um, in 
definitely in commercial settings. Um, the milk, the raw milk goes through a pasteurization step. And as we've mentioned, pasteurization is going to kill off um, the bacteria. This allows you to start with a clean slate. And because there can be differences between um, the chemical composition, uh, you know, the amount of proteins and fats and in that in the raw milk, um, it goes through the standardization and filtration process. This allows for every batch that's made to start have the same starting material before we enter into um, that fermentation. Okay, so again, this is, this is done in more large scale settings, um, in settings where um, we want, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, um, our material is being treated in a way that um, prevents there any kind of outside microbial growth. More traditional cheese making methods will utilize the microbes that are actually present in the raw milk um, and allow them to um, through like a natural fermentation to end up producing the cheese to undergo coagulation. Okay. Um, in either one of these, um, if you, if it undergoes pasteurization then you need to add enzymes into it because you've, you've killed off all those enzymes in the pasteurization process. And so this is where we would add renin um, into that. Um, so the combination of renin and also the microorganisms, um, and again, if we pasteurize it, we need to inoculate it with those microorganisms. Um, those allow for the coagulation or curding um, of the cheese. And so the, you know, that you know, old saying of like curds and whey, the whey is the liquid and the curds are the chunks that are left behind. The curds are the casein um, that's undergone coagulation. The whey is the other protein, and so um, if you've ever made cheese or seen cheese being made, which um, if you watch that um, cooked episode, um, you'll see the process of traditional cheese making, um, and and so you'll see what that um, whey looks like. So it's not just liquid. There are proteins in there because it has kind of like a whitish appearance to it, a milky appearance to it. Okay. Um, after coagulation happens, then what they'll do is cut the cheese. <laughs> and so that is the process where they um, cut, almost like mix it um, to make sure that um, all of that milk material has had an opportunity to coagulate, to mix with the renin, to mix with the microorganisms. Um, so this al allows there to be um, kind of a, stir a stirring and a cooking, if you will, of it. Um, and then next what happens is the whey is removed. Um, and so um, you, if you look at your food products, you'll notice that whey is added to a number of food items, um, such as breads and hot dogs and such. Um, so this increases the protein concentration. You can also buy whey um, as a protein supplement um, because this is kind of a byproduct of the cheese industry. And so obviously if we can utilize that somehow that it's beneficial, so it's not money out the window. Um, so then what happens is the curds are milled. Um, and so during, after the milling, breaking them up, um, this is where the cheese, um, salt could be added to the cheese to enhance flavor. Um, and then if it's a fresh cheese or a soft cheese like cottage cheese and cream cheese, um, then it would go on to packaging. Um, if it is a hard cheese, a cheese cheese that needs to ripen. Um, it can be poured into a mold and pressed. Um, additional whey ends up, additional liquids, which is the whey, gets um, squeezed out um, from it. And that can be collected and again, utilized in different aspects. Um, the cheese is then stored. And during that storing process is where the, the rind, the outside of the cheese, but also the inside of the cheese, ages and matures and ripens. And so this is another opportunity for microorganisms to play a role in what ends up being the end flavor of the cheese. And again, with the ripening process, it, process, it helps develop a complexity of um, the cheese's flavor, texture, and aroma, and all that's playing a role in how um, the microbes that are present are um, 
undergoing different biochemical reactions um, with it. So we have glucolysis going on, we have lipid lipidase going on, protease going on. So we're breaking down the proteins, the lipids, um, and the sugars that are present. There are many different methods um, to help that cheese develop or ripen. Um, so um, changing the temperature, adding enzymes, um, adding like a cheese slurry, which is basically like adding like a little microbial broth <laughs> to it, um, can all help to develop that. Um, you know, they're even looking at generation, um, genetically engineered starters and recombinant enzymes um, to help to develop the cheese. So again, looking at the different types of cheese, um, they can fall into two different categories. An unripened cheese is um, commonly referred to as a soft cheese or fresh cheese. Um, so these go through one um, round of metabolism, one round of fermentation. Um, they don't go through that ripening aging process. So again, your cottage cheeses, your mozzarella cheeses, um, you know, you can prepare them and eat them in the same day even. Um, with ripening, ripened cheeses, um, they fall into different categories as um, soft cheeses, semi-hard and hard cheeses. And it has um, a bit to do with how long they ripen um, and also what microbes are present and how, um, how, how, how broken down the proteins, the fats, and the glucose are, okay? So an example of a soft cheese is a brie cheese. Um, so for its secondary flora, um, penicillins and yeast play a role um, in the development and that liquidification of the proteins. For semi-hard cheese like Gouda and blue cheese, um, again, they have a secondary flora that plays a role into um, the flavor development of um, the cheese. And then for hard cheese, those would be um, kind of more of your run the mill cheese, like your cheddar cheese, your Swiss cheese. Um, and again, they also have secondary flora that play a role in their, the flavor development of those cheeses. So again, this is just to give you an overview of um, this chemistry behind what's going on. And so when we really, when we think about the flavoring, the ripening that happens, there's changes to the pH. Um, so there, again, there's this kind of second metabolism that goes on so that we get a lot of these aromatic um, compounds being produced. So it gives a different smell and a different taste um, to the cheese. And calcium phosphate is, um, so you can actually do calcium phosphate washes and salt washes of your cheese to help develop the flavors uh, as it ripens. So this figure just shows you some of um, the, the different um, biochemistry that's happening with the ripening of the cheese. So everything above that red box is, you know, what's happening on your for, if you will, your first fermentation, um, where we have the breaking down of the material um, of the casein, of the fats, um, and the sugars um, by our microorganisms that are present. But then when we're aging, aging the cheese, we have a second round of metabolism that goes on where those individual amino acids can actually be broken down further. Um, we can get a production of a lot of different molecules, as you can see below that red box, like um, carbon dioxide, thiol esters, keto acids, um, fatty ac uh, um, esters, alcohols, um, acetic acid, proponic acid, carbon dioxide. Um, so I, I already said carbon dioxide. Um, so a lot of different um, um, products being formed under the second metabolism. So it's not just you know, you can think of the first round of metabolism that happens as breaking down the material so it's available for the second round of metabolism. So when we look at um, dairy products, there's a number of ways to reduce the chance of spoilage. Um, so as, as we saw in a lot of these methods, um, they'll heat treat or pasteurize the raw milk, the starting material. So they're starting with a clean slate. So that helps to reduce spoilage. Also, um, 
the microbes that are involved actually create a low pH, so that makes it less favorable to some of those mesophiles that are potentially pathogenic. Also making sure there is refrigeration of raw material um, so that, there, that you don't have potential growth starting before you, um, you, know, you are utilizing it. Um, and I guess that's where with the traditional cheese making methods, they're making sure they're starting with high quality milk um, so that you don't have to go through this pasteurization process. Um, you can add preserves, per, preserves. Um, so lysozymes and EDTA are common um, additives that are added into to prevent um, food spoilage. There's a number of compounds that we've talked about um, that are produced by the microbes that produce the fermented foods, um, and these act as biopreservatives. And so organic acids like lactic acid, acetic acid, propionic acid, um, all those are produced, um, you know, in these products. And so they actually prevent the growth. And so, again, if you watch the cooked um, earth episode, um, they talk about how the lactobacillus bacteria actually produced acid and that actually prevents the growth of E. coli. And so um, it's a natural preserver one way to um, prevent the spoilage. Um, diacetic um, is, is an anti um, has been shown to be an antibacterial um, agent, so it works against gram-positive and gram-negatives. Um, also, some of the lacto lactic acid bacteria can produce hydrogen peroxide, um, so some bacteria can't deal with hydrogen peroxide, they die, hence why it can be used you know, as an antiseptic. Um, and so saying it's low amounts of it, so it's not like you're drinking hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then reuterine, um, and this, um, this protein actually is inhibit, can inhibit um, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And then there's a number of bactericidins um, that are produced by the bacteria that are naturally there. Um, so this table just looks at some of the different bactericidins um, that are produced. And so these are um, small proteins, peptides, um, that some of them have conserved amino acid sequence in them. And so they target um, other bacteria. And so again, the lactic, lactic acid bacteria, keep in mind, it's, it's there making the cheese for itself, right? Um, and so it wants to make sure that it inhibits the growth of other bacteria that are competing for the same resources. And so they produce these bac um, bactericidin bactericidins um, so that they end up damaging and inhibiting their um, growth of their competition. This gives us, you know, if they're present, that means that um, they're going to prevent the food spoilage in, you know, in eating the fermented food that the lactic, the lactic acid bacteria produce we're stealing their food source. Okay, so again, big picture piece is um, keep in mind that with these fermented foods that the microorganism is breaking down the material for itself um, because it needs a food source. And then we're benefiting from the change in texture, flavor, um, nutritional value of that fermented food because now we can consume it.